Uh, I invite you to consider another myth, and I say myth, which is, of course, the famous Hindu myth, that the universe is a drama. See, a drama is, uh, it, it is a, an image, just like an, uh, an artifact, considering the universe as something constructed, put together, manufactured. That's a myth. But the dramatic myth is different from the constructionist myth. In the dramatic myth, there is a very immediate relationship between any member of the world, that is to say, a human being, and the root and ground, what there is. Because in the dramatic myth, every one of you is basically connected with the reality which for untold billions of years has sparkled in these galaxies and nebulae. These are not things foreign to you. What you see outside you, or apparently outside you, although it looks distant and foreign, is most fundamental to you. There was sense in what is now only a superstition, astrology. Astrology as a means of predicting uh, what is going to happen to any individual in his life is, as far as I could make out, of almost no value. But there was one sensible idea behind it. When you cast a person's horoscope, what you did was you drew a map of the then known universe as it was at the time this child was born. And this was supposed to be a map of his soul. What an ingenious idea. It is to say your soul is the whole world as it focuses upon your moment. Now ordinarily when we talk of souls, we think of something clad in a sheet with holes in it, you know, like a Halloween ghost that is a kind of miasmic creature that inhabits your body and when you die it leaves you like the death leaves you. But that's not the soul at all. The soul is something which contains the body. The body doesn't contain the soul. The soul, if we put it into modern language, is the entire complex of relationships in whose context this organism exists. So it includes social relationships, communications relationships, dynamic relationships of heat and temperature, relationships with animals, with insects, with bacilli, relationships with gravity, with cosmic rays, and uh, interstellar balances. All these things, as they are focused at any individual point in the world, constitute the soul. And that was the truth in the astrological diagram. But we are as I said, taught to feel this system inside out. To ignore the soul and identify with the body, with the organism. It's not that the body and soul are different in the Cartesian sense. It's not that they're different substances. They're all the same world. The soul is the physical world in its entirety. And God only knows what that contains, because uh, our senses are attuned only to a very small uh, spectrum band of the physical world. But there it is. And if you persist in screening out the knowledge of yourself as all that has been defined in our system of conventions as other than you, 
you're going to be very unhappy. Because you're going to feel estranged. And this estrangement that we, most of us feel in our culture is reflected in things that we do that are very destructive. We constantly hear of man's conquest of nature. And we talk about the conquest of space. And we talk about when we climb great mountains, we speak as if we were conquering them. Why this hostility? Look at this rocket. These enormous, aggressive phallic emblems being zoomed at the moon. What do you think that means? They're going to screw the moon. <laughs> Poor old Venus. <laughs> well, now, this is a ridiculous way to explore space. We're not ever going to get anywhere in a rocket. It, it's, a, it's a crawling thing. It's a horse and buggy. If you want to explore space, the right direction to go is radio astronomy. Because that makes the outer space come to you. You don't have to go to it. <clears throat> You're in space. Here we are, floating on this earth, which is way out in space. We're already there. All we need to do to find out what's around us is get more sensitive, more open, develop things that are like the radio astronomical things. Maybe we can find instruments more sensitive yet than those. And they will bring the outside to us instead of going, boom and conquering it. And so in the same way, in California where I live, everything is being bulldozed. They go uh, to the hills. People would love to live in the hills. They take a bulldozer and they flatten out whole terraces in the Hollywood Hills and elsewhere and make them into tract lots where they can build conventional houses with the bank for finance. Whereas any good architect knows how to put a house bang on the side of a hill with making no more alteration in the land than building a road to get at it. Better still, on the top of the house, a landing for a helicopter. And then those hills aren't disturbed. People who want to live in the hills presumably want to enjoy the hills. They don't want to destroy them by living there. But that's what they do. So they conquer the hills. And they bash them about with bulldozers. And then the rains come. And since all the vegetation has been torn off, the, the soil starts to erode and eventually the house falls down the hill. So them right. But a good architect goes to a hill and says, Good morning. I'm delighted to meet you. I would like to live on you. And I would like you to tell me what kind of a house you would like me to build on you. And so he studies the nature of hills and eventually learns how to live on one without disturbing it. As a Zen Buddhist poem which says of a wise man, Entering the forest, he does not disturb a blade of grass. Entering the water, he does not make a ripple. Because he first of all becomes one with the environment. That is to say, in our more precise scientific language, he studies thoroughly the ecology of the situation before he does anything to interfere with it. We must interfere. We can't help interfering with the world around us, because even to know something is to interfere with it. Even when you shine a light on something to look at it, you alter it by shining the light on it. When you examine the behavior of an electron, you change its behavior. And so you want to know, what does it do when you're not looking at it? Does the light in the refrigerator go out when you close the door? How can you look inside to see? If we are sensitive enough to recognize that the outside world is our own physical body and that we should respect it just as we respect our own feet, head, hands and head, stomachs, uh, that's literally true. 
It's physical, not merely metaphysical. And so, with this fantastic technology that we have, we have power to alter the physical world as nobody ever had. But do we have the sensitivity to interact with the physical world as our friend, as our own body, as our own self? We don't have that sensitivity so long as our knowledge that this is so remains purely theoretical. Now, many scientists, biologists, ecologists, zoologists, botanists, uh, <coughs> forestry people, they know theoretically, up here, cortically, that this relationship exists. But they don't know it here. They are still Christian souls, living in bodies, constituting egos that came into this world instead of having come out of it.